All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back for day three of the E3Odd 2023 Meta Web3 Builder Competition and Bootcamp. My name is Kyle, and I'll be hosting today's workshops. E3Odd 2023 is a prominent Web3 summit dedicated to Ethereum, designed to gather developers and builders from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and other Middle East regions. We hope to provide insights from industry experts and engage in discussions around the future of blockchain. A big thank you to our community organizing committee, Therawatt Technology, Studio 1727, Chain IDE, Coffee with Crypto, and Mask Network. The schedule for E3Odd includes this online boot camp and competition from September 28th to October 10th, the in-person reception and conference on October 10th and 11th, and the online closing mixer on October 12th. Thanks again for joining us for day three of this event. And just a quick reminder that registration for the competition is open now, and there is a prize pool totaling $30,000. We will be hosting daily workshops until the 28th, and the competition submission deadline will be October 10th. For a detailed schedule and the latest information and updates about E3Odd and the Web3 um, Builder competition, please visit the website ethriad.com, follow us on Twitter at OXETHRIAD, and join the official Telegram for the event. Before we get started, we'd also like to thank our event sponsors, Web3 Port and Moon Capital. With that said, let's jump into day three. We have two workshops today, and we will be joined by Nico, a uh, global Dev developer relations engineer at Conflux Network, and Shantanu, who is head of Dev Relations at Lumos Labs. During today's sessions, if you have any questions, please leave them in the live chat. Our team will gather the questions, and they will post the answers at a later date in the Telegram group. So with that said, Let's get started and turn things over to Nico for their workshop, Conflux Network Development. Hello, and thank you for joining us in this workshop about development in Conflux Network. Whether you're an experienced developer or just beginning your journey in the blockchain world, this workshop is designed to provide you with the insights and hands-on experience that you need to start developing in Conflux Network. Before we delve into the content, let's briefly overview our roadmap for this session to provide a snapshot of the topics we'll cover and what you can expect to learn. Here is our agenda for this workshop. First, we will start with the foundational elements of Conflux Network, diving into its unique consensus mechanisms, its tree graph literature structure, the gas rule, and the concept of spaces. After that, we will transition to the essential tools for development on Conflux, covering wallets, faucets, Conflux scan, and other key development tools. And to wrap things up, we will engage in some hands-on demonstration, exploring the functionalities of Remix IDE, Hardhat, and the capabilities of the ThirWeb. By the end of this workshop, I hope you have a robust understanding of Conflux development and that you feel inspired to build your own projects on Conflux. Now, let's dive into our first topic. In this section, I will provide a quick overview of Conflux Network exploring its foundational elements and understanding what sets it apart in the blockchain world. Conflux is a decentralized layer one blockchain network and a smart contracts platform that combines high performance and security while keeping the transactions cost very low. At the heart of Conflux, there are four main elements that define its uniqueness. First, we have the tree graph ledger structure. Then we have the gas selection rule. We also have the spaces concept. And finally, 
we have its hybrid consensus mechanism that combines both proof of work and proof of stake. Now let's break down each one of these elements. Conflux implements a unique ledger structure called the tree graph. With a tree graph structure, each block not only has a single parent, but it also keeps a list of references to previous blocks. This provides very valuable information about the order in which blocks are created. When transactions come to play, Conflux employs the gas rule to choose a pivot chain within the tree graph. Then, using the pivot chain and the references between blocks, Conflux arranges the blocks into a linear sequence. This sequence determines the order in which transactions are executed, ensuring a smooth flow. Now, let's talk about the GAST selection rule. GAST stands for Greedy Heaviest Adaptive Subtree, and this is a clever solution developed by the Conflux Research Group to prevent the deepness attack issue. Traditional blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum follow a rule where only the longest chain survives, while the other chains are discarded. This approach creates a conflict between scalability and security, but Conflux takes a different path. Conflux replaces the longest chain rule with a new rule called GAST. This makes the selection process much stronger and robust. Instead of relying solely on the number of blocks, the block type is determined based on the historical structure of the tree graph. With GAST, the heaviest chain rule is used, but with a modified block weight system. It introduces different block weights and two different types of blocks. You have normal blocks and special blocks. In the absence of an attack, all newly generated blocks become normal blocks. However, if an attacker conducts a deepness attack, all newly generated honest blocks will become special blocks. So by incorporating different block weights, Conflux has the capability of maintaining its security even under challenging circumstances. Let's talk about the spaces on the Conflux network. Conflux has two independent spaces. You have core space and you have ESpace. Core space is the linear chain and provides more network capacity and has a gas sponsorship feature. However, it only supports Conflux compatible tools like Fluent Wallet or the Conflux SDKs. On the other hand, ESpace is a space designed to be fully compatible with the EVM. It allows you to deploy Ethereum smart contracts directly without changes, and you can also use familiar EVM compatible software uh, like Metamask, Truffle, Hardhat, uh, and others. Both spaces are independent in terms of having their own transactions, accounts, and contracts. However, they share the same underlying proof of work and proof of stake consensus layer and data storage infrastructure. The choice between core space and eSpace depends on your project's need and how familiar you are with the different tools. Now let's break down the information about proof of work and proof of stake on Conflux into simpler terms. Proof of work is a consensus algorithm used by blockchains like Bitcoin and previously by Ethereum. In simple terms, proof of work on Conflux involves miners solving puzzles and adding blocks resulting in a secure and reliable blockchain network. The first miner to solve the puzzle and add the block is rewarded with cryptocurrency, in, in our case with CFX. Conflux implementation of proof of work, thanks to the tree graph structure and gas rule, allows for greater scalability and higher transaction throughput. It reduces the chances of forks and ensures faster transaction confirmation times. To address the risk associated with proof-of-work, such as 51% attacks, Conflux introduces a proof-of-stake mechanism alongside with proof-of-work. Proof-of-stake adds an extra layer of security and efficiency to the network. In proof-of-stake, attackers cannot execute a double spending attack only based on computing power. They will need to invest enough cryptocurrency to influence the proof-of-stake decision. Conflux believes that the hybrid proof-of-work and proof-of-stake consensus mechanism 
provides better security and efficiency. On Conflux, the ordering of blocks is still handled by proof-of-work miners, while a small number of randomly selected nodes make independent proof-of-stake finality decisions. Now, let's move to the second section of our workshop. Now that we have laid the foundation with an understanding of the Conflux network, it's time to dive into the practical aspects. Let's explore the essential tools and platforms that will set you on the path to successful development of Conflux. First of all, if you want to interact with the Conflux network, you will need a wallet. Wallets are a fundamental tool in the world of cryptocurrencies and blockchain. They are software programs that let users store, send and receive cryptocurrencies. With wallets, users can securely interact with the Conflux network and perform transactions easily. They also help protect digital assets by allowing users to control their private keys. There are several options available for Conflux network. First, we have Fluent Wallet. Fluent is a Web3 wallet built specifically for Conflux Network, and it enables users to interact with decentralized applications and manage their assets securely and easily. With Fluent, users can easily manage their CFX, their ERC20 tokens, and NFTs on both Conflux Core Space and Conflux ESpace. Then we have MetaMask. Metamask is a very popular browser extension and mobile app that allows users to interact with decentralized applications on the Conflux network and many other blockchain networks. You just need to connect it to Conflux eSpace. And finally, you have Ledger. Ledger is a hardware wallet that allows users to store their private keys offline. With Ledger, you can manage your Conflux assets without exposing their private keys to potential threats online. Creating a wallet is always your first step, and with these options, you can choose the one that best fits your needs. Faucets play a crucial role, especially when you're just starting out. Faucets are tools that allow users to easily obtain CFX tokens for transacting on the network. Conflux provides faucets for both eSpace and Core mainnets as well as their respective testnets. Let me quickly show you how to use one of these faucets. First, navigate to the chosen Conflux faucet page. I will select the eSpace testnet one. Then, you just input the Conflux eSpace address where you'd like to receive the test tokens. Then, you just need to solve the CAPTCHA and click on the Claim button. In a few moments, you should receive the testnet CFX tokens in your wallet. Conflux faucets make it easy to get started, allowing you to test and experiment freely. Conflux Scan is the blockchain explorer for Conflux Network, and it allows users to explore and analyze data on Conflux. It provides a user-friendly interface for users to explore blocks, transactions, addresses, and smart contracts. It also enables users to read and interact with smart contracts, as well as deploying and verifying them. Let's dive into a quick demo. First, open the Conflux Scan website on your browser. As you can see, there is four different versions of this web page. There is one for Conflux Core Mainnet, one for Conflux eSpace Mainnet, one for Conflux Core Testnet, and one for Conflux eSpace Testnet. Here in the dashboard, you can see information about the network activity, such as the block number, accounts, transactions, contracts, the hash rate of the proof of work layer, and information about the proof of stake layer, such as the total CFX stake or the average APR. This is a real-time snapshot of the network activity. If you want to look up a specific transaction or an address, 
just paste it into the search bar and get the, all the detailed information. Conflux Scan is a key tool in the Conflux ecosystem and can help you a lot during the development process. Conflux Scan also provides a comprehensive API that allows developers to access blockchain data about the Conflux network. The Conflux API is an interface that allows developers to read and retrieve data from the blockchain. There is also four versions of this API. Now let me quickly show you how to use it. First, open the Conflux Scan API documentation website. Here you can see the four different APIs, one for each network. Now I will show you how to make an API call. As you can see, there is a lot of information you can retrieve here. Let's try fetching the amount of active accounts in the last days. I will click on a statistic account active. Then I will just click on trade out. And then I just click on execute. Here you can see the API's response with the amount of active accounts in a daily basis. And you also get a request URL you can use directly on your browser to retrieve the same information. You as developers can use the API to retrieve data in JSON format and you can use that data to build applications that interact with the Conflux network. When it comes to development, Conflux offers flexibility. In Conflux Core, smart contracts are also programmed using Solidity language. However, the network itself works a little bit different compared to EVM-based networks, and interacting with it requires using different SDKs and tools. However, the beauty of eSpace, given its full EVM compatibility, is that you can leverage most existing Ethereum development tools. Development in eSpace is pretty much like any other EVM-compatible chain. Most of the existing software, SDKs, frameworks, and tools that are used for developing on chains such as Ethereum, Polygon, or Binance Smart Chain can also be used for Conflux eSpace. This includes Remix, which is an open source web application that helps in smart contract development. There is also Hardhat, Truffle, and Foundry, which are powerful environments for smart contract compilation, testing, and deployment. Then you also have essential JavaScript libraries that are key to interact with the blockchain, such as Web3.js and Ethers.js. You also have Open Zeppelin, a library for secure smart contract development, and Theorweb, which is a platform that bridges the gap between the smart contracts and front-end applications. By knowing these tools, you will be able to build robust applications on Conflux. Now, Let's move to the third and most exciting section of our workshop. We have learned about Conflux Network and the tools to get started. Now it's time to roll up our sleeves and dive into some hands-on demos. Let's see these tools in action. Let's first dive into a hands-on demonstration using Remix ID. Remix is a powerful open source tool that allows developers to write, test, and deploy smart contracts with ease. Let's walk through the process together. First, open your web browser and navigate to the Remix IDE website. Next, let's create a basic smart contract. On the left panel, I will create a new file on the contracts folder. I will name it simplestorage.sol. This contract will allow us to store and retrieve a number. As you can see, this contract has two functions. You have set number, which is used to store a number in the blockchain, and we also have a function called get number, which is used to retrieve this information from the blockchain. Now that we have our contract, now it's time to compile it. On the left panel, click on the Solidity compiler icon. Ensure the correct compiler version is selected. Then click on the compile simple storage sol button. If everything is correct, you should see a green check mark indicating successful compilation. And now with our contract compiled, the next step is deploying it. Click on Deploy and Run Transactions on the left panel. Next, you need to select Injective Provider MetaMask. 
So we can deploy this contract using my MetaMask wallet, which is already connected to Conflux eSpace. And then you can deploy your smart contract by clicking on the deploy button. Now I need to confirm the transaction. You will see the contract appear under the deploy contracts section. And that's it. Here we can see our deployed smart contract. And this is our smart contract address. We can copy this address and check it on Coflux scan. You see it was deployed 28 seconds ago. Now let's go back to Remix and let's quickly test our contract. Under Deployed Contracts, click on Simple Storage and you can see that you have two functions, Set Number and Get Number. Now let's set a number, let's say 5. This will pop up a transaction I need to confirm with my MetaMask wallet. Now that the transaction is confirmed, we can use the get number function to retrieve this data from the blockchain. And as you can see, number five appears here. This way we can confirm that the smart contract is working as, as expected. And this is how you write, compile and deploy a smart contract using Remix IDE. This is a powerful tool that offers a lot of functionalities and I encourage you to explore it further on your own. Now let's dive into a hands-on demonstration using Harhat. Harhat is a development environment that streamlines the process of building on EVM compatible blockchains such as Conflux eSpace. It's a favorite among many developers for its simplicity and powerful features. First, Ensure you have Node.js installed on your machine. If not, download it and install it from the official website. Now, let's open Visual Studio Code and create a new folder for our project. Next, we will need to open a new terminal and install Harhat on this folder. For this, we just need to input the command npm install Harhat. Now, let's initialize a new Harhat project. To do this, we need to execute the command mpx harhat. Now that I'm running Harhat, it will ask me what do you want to do. I will choose to create a JavaScript project using the template Harhat already has included. I will just say yes to everything. Now that the project is created, I will have different folders with different files here on the Explorer. You can see there is a test, test script you can use. There is also a deploy script and there is also a smart contract here that is ready to use. We will use the smart contract that comes with this template for simplification purposes. And with our contract in place, now let's try to compile it using Harhat. For this, you just type in the command npx harhat compile. If everything is set up correctly, you should see a message indicating a successful compilation. And now let me show you how you can run tests using Harhat. We will use the test script that is included with this Harhat template. And to run this test, we just type npx Harhat test. 
If our contract and test are correct, you should see a message indicating a past test. Now the next step is deploying the smart contract. To deploy your smart contract on Conflux eSpace, you need to configure Hardhat to use Conflux as a default network. You just need to add this piece of code in the Hardhat configuration file, which includes the chain ID, the URL for an RPC provider, and you will need to include your own private key in order to deploy your smart contracts from an existing wallet. Now that I have configured Conflux as the default network, I just need to run the deploy script by using this command right here. Once deployed, you will see a confirmation message with the contract address. Let's copy this contract address and check it on Conflux card. And there you have it. We have set up a hard hard project, compiled, tested, and deployed a smart contract all within a few minutes. Hardhat truly simplifies the development process. With Hardhat, you can streamline your development process, making it faster and more efficient. Last but not least, let's explore ThirWeb. ThirWeb is a platform that makes it very easy to deploy a standard smart contract and has templates for building frontends that can interact with those smart contracts. Today, we will be using the ThirWeb dashboard to simplify the process of creating and managing NFTs. First, open your web browser and navigate to the ThirWeb website. Once there, Click on Get Started. Then, once in the dashboard, you just need to connect your wallet using the button on the top right corner. I will connect using MetaMask. If you haven't already, you will need to sign up and create a new account. After logging in, you will be greeted with the ThirWeb dashboard. Now, let's move to the Contracts tab. The next step is selecting the smart contract you want to deploy. I will select NFT Drop. And next, just click on Deploy Now. Fill in the project details such as the project image, give your NFT collection a catchy name, a symbol, and a description. Once done, you will need to select the network in which the smart contract will be deployed. I have selected Conflux eSpace. Finally, I will need to click on Deploy now. You will need to confirm the transaction in order to deploy the contract. And after that, a signature request will appear, which you need to sign using your MetaMask wallet. After the contract is deployed, the next step is to upload your NFTs images. To do this, you need to head to the NFTs tab. You can upload them one by one, or you can also do a batch upload. But for this workshop, I will just upload a single image. Here you will need to provide an image, a name, a description, and attributes that are optional, which might be the traits of your NFT. I will call it my NFT. Next step is to set up the claim condition. For that, I will move to the claim condition tab. And I will click on add phase. 
I will select public claim. Now for the fun part, mint in the NFT. On the NFT tab, you will need to click on claim button and the NFT will be minted to the address that you specify. Now let's see our NFT on the blockchain. Or here it is. And that's how simple it is to deploy and mint NFTs on Conflux using the Thiel Web Dashboard. Whether you're an artist, a collector, or just curious about NFTs, Thiel Web offers a streamlined experience, making the process accessible to everyone. I encourage you all to explore the platform further and experiment with the different features. And that wraps up our hands-on demos. We have seen the power of Remix IDE, the efficiency of Carhat, and the versatility of Tearweb. With these tools at your disposal, you are ready to create amazing projects on the Conflux network. As we draw to a close on this workshop, let me quickly share all the resources you need. Here you have the website, the documentation portal, the link tree to our community channel. I highly recommend joining the Conflux Developer Community, which is a space filled with developers and other enthusiasts, and that can provide you with the support and guidance you may need. Thank you for joining us in this workshop. We hope you find it informative and inspiring. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out to me. I'm available on both Telegram and Discord, and I'm excited to see the projects you will bring to life. Happy development and take care. All right. Let's give a thank you to Nico for that Conflux workshop. I'm moving on to our second and final workshop of the day. We are going to be joined by Shantanu for a workshop on zero knowledge proofs. Hi and good evening. My name is Shantu. I work as head of DevRel at Lumos Labs. Lumos Labs is a Web3 innovation company. We have been supporting devs to get into the Web3 space, uh, nurturing them with the newest Web3 knowledge available out there and helping them drive their Web3 building skills with the newest hackathons available out there by partnering with multiple teams. So here I am today talking more about what ZK proofs are, what is zero knowledge proofs. So let's deep dive into VKs today. So the agenda before I start, uh, I'll just brief up about the agenda that we'll be going through today. So we'll be looking at what ZK proofs are. Um, we'll be creating a basic application on Node.js using Nodeforge. Uh, we'll be also talking about the different different types of libraries and tools available out there to create your own ZK apps and different set of blockchain tools that you can use to create your own block, uh, block ZK, ZKP blockchains or ZKP rollups. So let's get started and let's first deep dive into what zero knowledge proofs are. So zero knowledge proof, again, it's a, it's to prove a single piece of knowledge without even revealing secret about it. So imagine that I want to reveal that my name is Shantanu to people without telling that I'm. So imagine a celebrity going on stage singing, right? So a lot of people recognize their voice and try to relate with the celebrity that they know. So let's first say that there is a singer from uh, let's suggest Justin. So let's let's say Justin Bieber sings on stage, and he's all masked out. So nobody knows that he's really Justin Bieber until he takes his mask off. 
So he starts singing and people can start recognizing his voice. So basically, he's proving people without telling them who he really is. I mean, it's not really ZK, but I'm just giving an example of how on a basic gist of how ZK works. He's trying to understand how it works. Cool. Um, so sorry, I had a technical glitch. So, um, yeah, so coming back, so let's first suggest we will start singing and then people start recognizing him through its traits, right? The voice modulation, the lyrics, the way he's singing, right? So that's how people can get to know that he is. But similarly, in the ZK area, in the ZK proofs, so there are two entities who participate in the whole ZK knowledge transfer or the whole ZK process. One being the proof, prover, second being the verifier. So third, thirdly, ZKs have a lot of cryptographical applications. So uh, starting from, you know, banking transactions to digital identity, ZK can be used all of these spaces. We'll have a deep dive into the applications as well by the end of this session. Okay. So let's understand what ZK is and what are the costs that is involved to run a ZK protocol. So one being iterative. So ZK, to prove a ZK or to prove a ZK knowledge, zero knowledge proof, there are two parties, as I said, involved. One being the prover, second being the verifier. So both of these have to run in a very iterative manner, right? And when there is iterative, uh, you know, when there is iterative running of any function in, the, in, in general in the programming space, in the computer space. So cost, high cost is definitely involved, right? So when there is a huge amount of iteration done, so there is a cost, cost involved without even, uh, you know, having third parties involved. And in, in terms of cost measures, one being the execution time complex. So executing a, a ZK can be, you know, time has a lot of time involved. And and in terms of the communication cost and communication latency, there is a delay and the number of bit exchange, right, is heavy. So these are the parameters that are involved uh, when there is a ZK proof, when there is a zero knowledge is being proved. So let's, let's talk more from the bookish language now. So a toy example of ZK, right? So how will you explain zero knowledge proof to a kid, to a five years old kid? So now let's understand the basic example. Uh, let's understand ZK from a basic example. Uh, so let's talk about Alibaba's case. So this is a general example. Uh, I hope you get to know what ZK is. So let's try and let's understand. So look at this cage right now. I hope you can see that on my screen. So if you can see, there are there is a maze. This is a cave. And if you can see here, a, B, C, D, there are multiple areas, multiple checkpoints that are created. So when somebody has to start from A and has to reach this spot, which is between C and D, right? So let's deep dive into how the prover and verifier thing works in this particular example. So there are two people here, one being Peggy, who is the prover, and there is Victor, who is the verifier, okay? Now, Peggy wants to prove the knowledge of the secret word of the cave to Victor without revealing it. Now, this space between the C and D can only be opened through a secret word, right? So, how, what is that secret word? Nobody knows. Only Peggy knows it. And she wants to give access to Victor to the cave, but he can only get access to Peggy. Peggy doesn't want to share the code. So, what will she do here? So, this is Alibaba's cave. Now, let's start understanding how the proof will work. So starting at point A, right over here, Peggy will walk all the way to either C or D to prove the C, to prove to Victor that she knows the secret key. Now, Victor walks to point B. Victor will walk all the way to point B. Now, Victor asks Peggy to either come out of the left passage this way or this way. Peggy does that you uh, Peggy does that using the secret to repeat this step until Victor is convinced. So what will essentially happen here that this space um, is where Peggy is. All right. Now Victor will enter from A, come till B, and now he'll ask Peggy to come out of this cave, this particular cave, from either this way or from either this way, either from C side or either from D side. And once and 
and once he comes out of this space, what obvious factor will be proved? Saying Peggy knows the secret key. If she doesn't know the secret key, how will she come out of the particular cave, right? So this is what ZK is. Peggy is proving to Victor that she knows the secret password to the cave, and she's getting into it. That's the whole thing. Now let's talk more about the proof that is being proved. So one being complete. So if Peggy knows the secret word, she can completely prove the uh, complete complete the proof successful. So she can prove that she knows the particular secret key and she can get out of the cave. That is completeness. Next being sound. So if 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 Peggy does not know the secret key, it is high. It is highly not possible for her to come out of the cave. It is not highly po- uh, possible for her to pass all of these particular rounds that is mentioned here. Second, zero knowledge. No matter what is happening around the whole transaction of Peggy Pitt and Vector. Vector may not learn what the secret case, unless and until he asks. So that is zero knowledge. So Peggy is not transferring anything to Vector; he's just proving it to her that she knows it. That is zero knowledge. And next step is if Vector even tapes up all the entire protocol, he cannot convince other that Peggy knows the secret case. And non-transferable. Vector cannot use the proof to pretend that he knows it. Because it is not trans. So number of rounds. How many rounds are needed to prove that Peggy knows it? So one being completeness again. We'll again go to the same properties. If Peggy knows the secrets, she will pass all the rounds, no doubt, right? Soundness. If Peggy does not know the secret, she can pass the round with a probability of one by two is to k, where k is the number of rounds. This is the formula that we use at PK. Um, an optimal number of round k. So this is a mathematical stuff that we'll be skipping for some time because zk mathematical can be a little complex down the line. So what I would also recommend is I can drop some links, relevant links to you, and you can have a check at those papers. So before we move to the, all the applications of zk, let's talk about the past of zk. How it all started? How was it invented? So zk, the the term zk zero knowledge was coined way back in 1985. Uh, there was a paper by three academists uh, who launched this whole concept of ZK zero knowledge proof. And uh, that's when the uh, that's when the term was coined and start, people started getting into the space, people started experimenting more on it. And this got um, more adaptive when the blockchain space came into the action. So in the whole blockchain and Web3 era, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of applications of cryptography happened Right, so like account distraction and externally owned accounts and stuff like that. That's when also zk came into the picture when the web space was evolved, and now zk is part of most of the ecosystems uh, applications that are out there, and people are adapting it. It is still being rehearsed, but people are adapting it now on a larger scale now. So let's have a look at applications of zk. So one being identity schemes, um, multimedia security, digital watermarks, network privacy. Digital cash, offline digital coin systems, voting, public key cryptography, and smart card. So one being identification schemes. So identification scheme uh, in which two persons, I mean, one being the system and another being the user, has to prove that each other know some some part of the conversations, and the identity of a user is proved. That is identity schemes. What? Why zk for identity schemes? Um, one being in some applications, it is desirable that the identity of a specific user is maintained secret to the system. So in some cases, user doesn't want to get out all the information that it has to the system. That's when ZK comes into the picture, wherein an investor, for example, wants to access a stock market database, preferring to hide his identity. I don't want to, I don't want people to know that I am accessing that database, right? And that's when ZK can come into the picture. Or maybe I have some valuable information that I want to share with a couple of people, but I don't want to reveal that information. But if I'm a secret agent in some country and I want to reveal the secret information, that's when ZK can come into picture. So there are two modes of identities, right? So one being the normal mode and second being the private mode for the users. So in the normal mode, the user reveals his identity to the system. So in, in the Facebook era, let's talk about Facebook first. So in the Facebook, what do you essentially do? You give out all the information that you have, your email, password, um, first name, last name, date of birth, everything that you have. And it is a normal mode. And the privacy or the private mode, what happens is the identity of user is uh, is maintained heavily anonymous to the system. System doesn't know who you are. 
Okay. So digital watermarks. So um, way before when the internet era or the streaming era started, right? Before the OTT things, there were a lot of plagiarism that were happening. People used to download movies from torrent. People used to download music from pirated sites, and it was very prevalent in that point of time. I'm talking somewhere around. I mean, specifically for Indian time, I'm talking somewhere around. 2005 to 2010 this is the timeline that happened and even in 2010 it happened pretty dominantly until unless the ott era started in india so you know a lot of digital art or sorry a lot of artists who who used to present their content digitally like the movies or music they faced the big problem in you know in in defining the ownership of the media object so if i pull up any media directly from any of the pirated sites rename it in my way and put it on you it was okay at that time so and i used to earn money right by either selling it off or either by giving it to people you know that's how it used to work and even theft right so pe- getting say, saying that people can really uh, screw you at that uh, so sue you at that point you know that was not possible but it is possible so why zkp so in this case zkp or zero knowledge proofs it is to prove the existence of a mark without revealing what the mark is so you can put up a watermark but where the watermark what the watermark you cannot really do you you you, you should not really do but there is a uh, watermark within the object and if somebody wants to remove it or want to play along with it they can be caught so that's how digital watermarks can be used in the multimedia securities network privacy is anonymity To stay anonymous for the user, we'll skip that for now. Let's talk about digital cash. So, one of the one of the prevailing things, or one of the most amazing things that Web three has introduced people is anonymity, or you know, staying anonymous and being secure at the same point in time. So, what ZKP gives you, it helps you achieve the privacy of the customers. So, if I if I'm a bank. And if I have like a set n number of customers staying in, uh, in in front of me, so my job right now is to get all the KYC that is possible to make sure that it is fraud it's fraudulent. Nobody is doing some fraud to my bank. Nobody is taking some unregulated loans, and people are paying my for loans if I'm giving them some loans. That's the basic KYC know your customer process that every bank follows at this point in time. So what will happen? Oh my bad, sorry. So what will happen with these digital cash and offline digital systems? So the banks these days are, uh, you know, they can still use your data without even proving that it's you. You you don't have to share all the data that you want. You can share whether the particular doc, uh, property is owned by you. You can share whether the, uh, you know, you you have taken the things like uh, loans and stuff from the bank and stuff like that, and. Security needs. Why do we need it? One thing: the bank want to able uh, to detect all the reuse of or forgery of digital digital coin. The money that you take from the bank, the bank needs to know that you are taking. That's the process. Moving next, electronic elections. So, to ensure the privacy of the voter, you know, a lot of vote in the political systems. A lot of things change day and night, right? And by bringing zk. Into the picture, you can make you can make sure that the privacy is maintained for the user while the user votes for the particular candidate he or she likes. So that is why it is important. Public key cryptography. Being... Let's move. Okay, so let's talk about five parameters that are essential for a zk or the zero knowledge proof. One being completeness. So if the prover knows the secret, the verifier accepts the proof with an overwhelming probability. So completeness is the first property of any zk. Next step being the soundness. So if the prover does not know the secret, it is highly unlikely that the verifier will accept the proof. That is soundness. Third being zero knowledge. So verifier cannot learn the secret even if the even if he or she deviates from the protocol. Right? If the prover Gives you the access to the uh, give proves your particular validity. You cannot really really know the secret key of it. You cannot really uh, learn the secret even if he or she you know tries to give you hints. It it different. It becomes very difficult. And the next property means the prover can repudiate the proper uh, to the proof to a third party. I mean, I know the secret, and I have tell I have told you as the secret. Now you can go ahead and tell people that he knows the secret. Right, that is possible, of course. 
non transferable the verifier cannot pretend to be the prover to any third party and that is something that dzk gives you okay so let's deep dive into how the zero knowledge proof architecture looks like in the blockchain ecosystem so we spoke about zk in very detail we spoke about how zk works we spoke about an example as well so let's talk about some more examples um, on what are the different set of blockchains that are there what what you can use to build your own zk apps so there are multiple zk apps that you can use and one of them being starknet um we can you can use you can have a look at starknet and there is zk sync as well which is a zk roll up um built on top of ethereum so let's talk more on the grounds of zk roll ups so zk roll ups or the zero knowledge roll ups are basically the layer to scaling solutions that basically increases the frequency of transactions on top of ethereum and it helps by moving out the computation from the main chain and state storage off chain so everything is off ethereum chain there is l2 that manages everything and then gradually things are moved to ethereum or maybe a master contract and then things are moved to ethereum that's how it works so zk uh, basically can process like thousands of transactions in a patch and then post some minimal summary data to the mainnet which is ethereum mainnet so basically this um, summary data that defines the changes that should be made to ethereum and and some cryptographical proofs that are there are then posted to the mainnet that's how things work at the zk rollups right so what are different types of zk sorry sorry what are the uh, set of rollups that you can create so let's talk about um how zk interacts with ethereum so as you know zk chains and zk rollup chain are off chain protocols that are, that operate on top of ethereum blockchain and it's managed by on chain ethereum smart contracts basically okay so um there are again two types of architectures that uh, that are primarily there one being the off chain contracts and second being off chain virtual machines so let's talk about off chain con on chain contracts so as mentioned before um the zk protocol is controlled by smart contracts running on top of ethereum um this also includes the main contract which which stores roll up blocks um uh, track deposits monitor state updates and things like that another on chain contract all right another on chain contract the verifier contract verifies the zero knowledge proof submitted by the block producer thus ethereum serves as the base layer of layer 1 for the zk roll ups so that is on chain contract and next comes is the off chain virtual machine so while the zk protocol lives on ethereum transaction execution and state storage that happens separately independent on the evm chain so this often vm or the often virtual machine is the execution environment for the transactions on the zk rollups and it serves as the secondary layer or the l2 for the zk rollup protocol and the validity is validity pools sorry the validity proof verified on ethereum mainnet guarantees the correctness of state transaction in the off chain way so that is off chain virtual machine for you and the other one was uh, on chain contracts so these are a different set of uh, zero knowledge proofs so let's also talk about how does the roll up works so as you know a roll up the transactions are submit uh, users in the zk roll up uh, sign the transaction submit to an l2 operator for processing and these process processes are then concluded in a batch and then that batch pulls the summary data to the mainnet so that's how the zk roll up transactions work so let's look more from the grounds of different set of steps that are involved so first step being um, zero knowledge part simplified part we spoke about it so one being circuit and there are multiple libraries clock long zk snark so You you have a set of different um, you know applications here. Sorry, files here. One being the VASP file, zk file, verified or sol, verified or solidity file, the smart contract that you create, and the witnessed calculator comes here. We'll be creating this application um, down the line, but I'm just giving an example of the overview here. Next being the smart contract, which is which are the essential part. So we have a verified smart contract and the H check, which is again the prover smart contract. So we we write this in solidity and then we have user jump browser so we either we we create all of these in the app called zkblock 
and this is deployed on a smart contract, maybe like Ethereum or Polygon or any of those blockchains. So what will essentially happen is there is one user who will privately input his age, right? Now, the blockchain, what will essentially do is it will verify whether the age is right or not for a particular user. So that's the case. That's how the application will work. Now, let's look at the application that we created. Very basic application. So if you look at this application, we have a we have a set of things that are there. So um it will so we have a secret key that is called my secret, and this will be the secret that Prover wants to prove the knowledge of. So my secret, this needs to be proved and excuse me. Yeah. So if I change uh, if I go ahead and you need this node force library, which is important. If you need to go node test.js. The proof is valid. So what it essentially is doing is it is generating a proof prover. There are there is one called prover function, which proves, which is proving uh, which is creating a secret, which is creating a proof. Second is a verifier who is verifying the proof on your behalf. So even if I change to space, well, proof is true, right? So this is the secret that I have, and this is a secret that is wrapped in the secret in the prover secret key. Verifier is basically uh, forcing that SHA two fifty six key that we are creating. So this is the key that we create here. And this key is being verified using the hash value. So this is the hash value that we written here. So even if you do that, like um, console.log hash value, you'll get the hash value right over here. You can see the hash value. This value is being mapped here. And if both of them match, proof equals to true. That's how it works. So basic, basic zero knowledge application. Um, in the next lecture, in the next video, we'll be also creating a detailed application of on how ZK works, and we'll be deploying it on blockchain. Thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, thank you so much for giving your time. It was wonderful here, uh, wonderful talking to all of you. See you soon. All right, a big thanks to Shantanu for that wonderful, wonderful workshop. So that was our final workshop for day three. We will be back again tomorrow at the same time for day four. Uh, we hope to see you there and please go ahead and give 0x e 3 odd a follow on X, formerly Twitter. Um, and if you want more information, you can check the official telegram or the website e 3 Thank you all. Have a good day.